During the 70s and 80s, social constructionist theories gained prominence in the humanities and social sciences. These theories examine how societal norms, beliefs and practices shape the way we understand reality, and, in some cases, go as far as challenging the traditional view held by many academics that scientific knowledge is an objective reflection of reality. Against this backdrop, certain scientists began to express concern over some of the more extreme forms of social constructionism. Among them were Norman Levitt and Paul Gross, who co-authored the book titled Higher Superstition, The Academic Left and Its Quarrels with Science. The publication of the book is widely regarded as the spark that ignited the so-called Science Wars, a series of heated intellectual debates about science, philosophy and postmodernity that encompasses and anticipates many of the themes of the 21st century culture wars. In Higher Superstition, Gross and Levitt argued that some feminist critiques of science extended beyond legitimate concerns about sexism in scientific communities. The two authors referenced feminist academics, who viewed some of Francis Bacon's writings on the conquest of nature by man as indicative of a male-coded patriarchal endeavour, but used metaphors that suggested sexual domination, reminiscent of rape. They also examined, with sardonic curiosity, feminist critiques that seemed to imply that a masculine science tortured and vexed matter through the use of high-energy particle accelerators, in order to extract its valuable secrets. Among their many targets, Gross and Levitt then mocked melanists, the believers in the fact that people with more melanin, the primary skin pigment in humans, are superior to those with less. Melanist views, represented in academia by people like Leonard Jeffries, once the departmental chair of black studies at the City College of New York, went as far as claiming that black people had superior mental physical and paranormal powers, granted to them by their higher levels of melanin. Some of the more prominent targets of the two scientists included post-structuralists and postmodernists, such as Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, Jean-François Lyotard and Bruno Latour, whom they indicted for their role in undermining the objective foundations of scientific inquiry. Additionally, The critiques in higher superstition were particularly vigorous against the works of sociologists Andrew Ross and Stanley Aronowitz, the latter being the author of Science as Power, which described science as functioning as a form of, at times, oppressive authority in the service of capitalism. Gross and Levitt considered these claims a travesty, and dedicated substantial portions of their work to debunking them. The academic response to the publication of Higher Superstition was an incendiary mix. Some scholars appreciated Gross and Levitt's work, while others accused them of using polarizing language in an arrogant way to misrepresent the authors they criticized. A major point of critique was that the book didn't contend with the anti-science tendencies of the right a purported shortcoming that even the authors discuss in the preface to the 1998 edition, where they mention that if they were to rewrite the book, they would include a chapter on conservative creationism. In the midst of these controversies, a physics professor, that had always identified as being on the left, stumbled across the book and was struck by its provocative title. His name was Alan Sokol. His first impression, as he recounted in an interview he gave to the Chronicle, was Oh no, not another one of those right-wing diatribes that tell how the Marxist deconstructionist professors are taking over the universities and brainwashing our children. However, after reading the tome and the works of those it critiqued, Sokol came to believe that, despite some disagreements, the book had far more merit than he initially assumed. Captivated by what he had read, he decided to conduct an informal experiment. He would test whether a quote-unquote postmodern journal 
would accept a deliberately nonsensical paper if it flattered the editor's ideological preconceptions. So he wrote an article that was intentionally laden with illogical conclusions, meaningless jargon and flawed reasoning, evident enough that even an undergraduate physics student could easily identify it. He then submitted the article for publication in the journal Social Text, for which the ordinary reviewing process consisted in four editors reading the piece to assess its quality. Two of these editors were Andrew Ross and Stanley Aronowitz, the sociologists vehemently criticised in Higher Superstition. After corresponding with an editor, the article was published with no significant revisions. Later so-called disclosed that it was a hoax and the reaction was explosive. Some professors accused him of unethical deceptive behaviour by having breached the trust inherent in academic publishing, while others praised him for having exposed postmodern nonsense. When asked for a statement by the Chronicle, both Ross and Aronowitz declined to comment on the editorial process. The journal's official response in writing was that although they initially found the article offbeat and awkward, they regrettably decided to publish it in a special science war issue to include a fresh perspective from an outsider. Having been asked why he engineered the hoax, Sokol replied, I confess that I'm an unabashed old leftist who never quite understood how deconstruction was supposed to help the working class, and I'm a stodgy old scientist who believes naively that there exists an external world but there exist objective truths about that world, and that my job is to discover some of them. Following the scandal, Sokol, with his co-author Brickmont, wrote a book focused on the postmodern misuses of scientific terminology. It was entitled Fashionable Nonsense, Postmodern Intellectuals' Abuse of Science. The standard response from the postmodern segment of academia to the publication of the book was that Sokol and Brickmont misrepresented the intellectuals they criticised, and that, in general, they didn't know what they were talking about. Moreover, some said that the level of rigour they wished to impose on disciplines outside their expertise would be excessive and inappropriate. In an article published by Le Monde, Derrida characterised Sokol as not serious and akin to a practical joker. He then called the whole affair sad because it ruined the chances of there being a serious reflection. However, he refrained from elaborating on the specific inaccuracies in Sokol and Brickmont's treatment of postmodern theory, due to the limited space available in their journalistic medium. Instead, Bruno Latour, who was heavily criticised in Fashionable Nonsense, wrote an article where, among other things, he stated... Was I wrong to participate in the invention of this field known as science studies? Is it enough to say that we did not really mean what we said? Some took this as an admission of guilt of sorts. The scientific community that valued Sokol's work, that included academics of the calibre of Noam Chomsky and Richard Dawkins, occasionally lamented the limited engagement marked by only a few exceptions with the more substantial criticisms spurred by fashionable nonsense, particularly those concerning the alleged use of obscurantist language by some continental philosophers. This led to the impression among some that no prominent postmodern philosopher comprehensively rebutted the critique. For Sokol, the negative side of the whole affair was that it provided ammunition for anti-intellectual currents to dismiss academia entirely, without differentiating between genuine intellectuals and impostors. A curious event that served to re-accentuate controversies was the Tessier affair. Tessier, a model and astrologer in France, presented in 2001 a dissertation for a PhD title at the Sorbonne University in which she argued that astrology was being oppressed by the monolithic thought of science. Her thesis supervisor was Michel Maffezoli, 
a prominent sociologist known for his work on postmodernity and the relationship between aesthetic and social life. At the conclusion of her defence, the jury granted Tissier her doctoral degree with a very honourable distinction. Controversy erupted. The whole ordeal was called a farce, and 370 sociologists signed a petition denouncing the affair. Mafezoli felt that he was the target of a manhunt, spurred by some kind of academic jealousy. Subsequently, the French Association for Scientific Information analysed the thesis, and found that it lacked the basic academic requirements of objectivity and intellectual honesty. About a decade later, Mafezoli declared in an interview that he was happy to have supervised the thesis, and if he had the occasion, he'd do it again. In 2015, two former students of Mafezoli took inspiration from Sokol and wrote an article intended to be farcical, centred on how an electric car-sharing service in Paris created a new semantic basin, no longer the phallus and seminal energy of a sports car, but the welcoming uterus of a small electric vehicle. The article was meant to demonstrate the absurdities Mafezoli endorses. After a peer review in a journal Mafezoli directed, it was promptly published. The revelation that it was a hoax induced the eminent sociologist to resign his role of director. As just exemplified, the so-called hoax inspired a wave of subsequent academic publishing sting operations, many of which were successful. These operations extended beyond the realms of sociology and philosophy, impacting journals in medicine, computer science, and occasionally physics as well, leading many to question the functioning of a peer review process in a wide variety of fields. Some also took this as an indication that the impact of a so-called hoax on postmodernism had been overstated. The most recent chapter of what may be called the continuation of the science wars has been the Grievance Studies Affair, another publishing sting operation involving three hoaxers who aimed at exposing fields they perceived as solely concerned with perpetuating ideological grievances, such as queer, race and gender studies. The hoaxers, among them philosopher Peter Boghossian, believed that these fields started with a predetermined thesis and worked back to find evidence to confirm it, without ever being critical of their initial assumptions. So they decided to create 20 fake papers to prove their point, of which several, but not all, were accepted and published in peer-reviewed journals, until the publishing sting operation was discovered prematurely. Among the accepted papers, one concerned how dogs were engaging in rape culture. The paper was honoured for excellency. But the impact, the ethical implications, and the validity of the methodology used by the hoaxers is being discussed to this day. When Sokol was asked in 2024 if things were getting better or worse, he said that sometimes he felt like he had won the battle but lost the war.